Nottingham University. He afterwards studied for a master's degree uh, in the field of mathematical physics at LMU Munich and Max Planck Institute for Physics. His work was on applications of transcendence theories in holography. His PhD is from Technical University of Vienna, and he worked on automatic for automorphic forms in string theory, moonshine, and wall crossing. Furthermore, he's a Marshall Fellow at Stanford University with Shamit Kachu and co current long-term visitor at Stanford. Since 2020 November, so quite recent, he's a postdoc at IPMU, and his re re main research interests are on aspects of number theory, geometry, and physics. His talk will be about moonshine phenomenon in physics. So Abiram, I leave you the screen. Okay. And I will warn you at, in the last five minutes, okay? Okay, perfect. Thanks, Jim. So thank you very much for having me um, speak at this virtual conference. Uh, of course, naturally, one would have liked to have been in Istanbul. It's been a very long time since I lived there. Uh, that's also another fun fact. I used to live in Istanbul for a few months. Um, but today I decided to talk after Chem's request on moonshine. And I know it's not the most, um, it's not a topic which could be made very pedagogical quite easily because of the extensive background that's required. But today what I want to do is make it as extensive as possible and make it as pedagogical as possible. And um, I will talk about moonshine and in particular give you um, an explanation about Malter and Mathieu moonshine phenomena. And uh, I should ask, am I still audible right now? Can you hear uh, me? This is better, I guess. Okay, this is Earlier, better. Can... We couldn't hear you very well. Okay. Um, so let me know in case anything is not clear or except for not being audible. Um, I also will uh, have to give a set of lectures at some other school on Moonshine at some point in the future. So I'll put my notes up on this particular website over here. And I'm happy to share my slides with you as well. So. Um, to give an overview of the talk will be about, I will first go over a bit of number theory basics that's required to understand moonshine phenomena, and also the necessary for the group theory that one needs to understand moonshine. Um, I will give you an example of moonshine at something known as weight zero, which is of one example is the monstrous moonshine, and then talk about moonshine at weight half, an example of which is the Matthew moonshine. And I will tell you how all of this fits into some aspects of string theory and physics. And uh, so, yeah. Uh, let's begin. The, um, the first part of this talk really motivates a bit of number theory and modular forms. And in order to understand number theory and modular forms, we need to understand a bit of the modular group, which is SL2Z. So starting point to understand any of these things, if you open a standard number theory textbook, is the definition of the upper half plane. So the upper half plane is just a set of all complex numbers with so the imaginary part is greater than zero. Now the upper half plane admits the action of an SL2R um, group via these things known as Mobius transformations, where tau just goes to A tau plus B over C tau plus D, and A, B, C, D are elements of the SL2R group. And the SL2R group basically is the group of two by two matrices defined over reals with, determin with, with determinant one. And uh, we are gonna be interested in a subgroup of SL2R, which is SL2Z which is basically just the two by two matrices defined over the integers, which, which with determinant one. Now SL2Z, many of you may already know, is the modular group of the two torus. And in the sense that the tau parameter over here defines a complex torus with tau equals tau one plus I tau two. And you could think of it as a lattice in the um, complex plane as, or the upper half plane as such, where you define a particular lattice of this nature. And by modding out the complex plane by this, tor by this lattice, you actually recover a particular two torus. And by changing the different values of tau, you get a different lattice and thereby you get different tori. So in some sense, you could generate the whole space of two tori by just actions of SL2Z. And that's the interpretation of what SL2Z actually is for us. Um, another set of uh, groups that are, will be relevant in the study of moonshine are known as congruent subgroups of SL2Z. So these are some group of SL2Z which have a certain, um, certain patterns in them. So for example, gamma naught of N is just the elements of SL2Z where C is zero mod N. 
and um, for n greater than one, and you have gamma one of n, where basically um, uh, a equals one mod n um, in this particular um, matrix, which belongs to gamma not n already. So C is zero mod n and A is one mod n. And then you of course have gamma n, which is basically where A and D are one mod n and B and C are zero mod n. The reason we talk about congruent subgroups is that they appear in so-called arbifolded physical theories. And for example, when you twist or twine the torus, you expect to see these sort of groups over here. And these groups will play a very important role in the understanding of moonshine phenomena for us. So let's do a bit more number theory right now. Uh, so let's define what um, a modular form is. The S2Z group actually has a set of well-defined action on certain functions on the upper half plane. And these are known as modular forms. So a modular form is a function, it's a holomorphic function from the upper half plane to the complex plane. And it has a particular weight K. And it has a particular transformation property that F of tau goes to F of A tau plus D or C tau plus D, where A, B, C, D is an element of SL2Z matrices and it transforms in this particular covariant manner. And K here is known as the weight of the modular form. Um, modular forms are holomorphic at the limit that you send tau goes to I infinity, and they have a well-defined Fourier expansion even at tau goes to I infinity. And you can do the Fourier expansion because of the fact that it is a periodic function in the variable tau. That is, you can set tau goes to tau plus one. In fact, this is the, tau tr the T transformation that you can actually do in SL2Z. And because of periodicity, you have a Fourier expansion, and that allows you to write down f of tau in terms of this particular Q series. So the series is something that you saw already from Pavel's stock um, before mine. Um, and you have this particular Q series over here. And the A of n are Fourier expansion coefficients. So in Moonshine, A of n would be central for us. Um, a bit more about modular forms right now. Um, if you're considering modular forms on SL2Z, these are functions which have weight K and K is always even weight with K greater than or equal to four. And the ring of all modular forms is generated by the so-called Eisenstein series on SL2Z. So you have the Eisenstein series on SL2Z, which is given by E4 of tau and E6 of tau, given by these expressions over here. And they have a Q expansion as follows. They're both modular forms and they, Meaning of this statement is that if you have any f of tau of a given weight k, you can write this modular form as a linear combination of this particular of e4 tau and e6 tau, where 4 alpha plus 6 beta sums up to give you the weight of the modular form. And c alpha beta are real coefficients. So an example of the modular form um, is, which we will see in this talk, is the 1 or eta tau to 24 or basically the Dedekind eta function, that's a well-known modular form, but it's not necessarily modular in SL2Z, but one or eta tau, to, eta tau to 24 is modular in SL2Z, and it's given by this expression over here. It is a very important, um, it, it has a lot of physical significance because it is precisely the partition function of 24 free bosons of a torus in conformal field theory, but it's also the partition function of half DPS states in heterotic string theory when you compactify down to four dimensions on, um, on a six torus. And uh, number theoretically, it's basically the index partition function of 24 colors, which was studied by Hardy and Ramanujan back in the 19, 1910s or 1920s or something. Um, right. You can also analogously define modular forms for congruent subgroups where you just define um, this particular transformation property, but then state that A, B, C, D is an element of the congruent subgroup. But when you deal with congruent subgroups, there is a side subtlety that you have to keep in mind, which is that you don't have a particular notion of an S transformation. That is, you just cannot send tau goes to minus one over tau. So there is a way that you work around this, and that's known by doing linear evolutions, but I won't go into this right now. Um, so it's not really required, but if you want to know more about it, please do feel free to ask me. Um, when you define modular forms and congruent subgroups, they are still um, uh, periodic in this tau variable, which means that they do still admit a Fourier expansion, and then you can still do a Fourier expansion analogous to um, this expression over here for um, modular forms on congruent subgroups as well. Um, in order to study moonshine, 
the first example Munchen that we would study has to do with modular functions, not exactly modular forms. So modular functions you can think of as being which are almost like modular forms, but not quite modular in the sense that they are meromorphic at certain isolated points. So for example, we have um, a very famous example is the, the Klein J function. The Klein J function with some sort of normalization, you subtract the 77744 from the J function to give you something known as a normalized J function over here. The normalized J function is a modular um, function uh, with this following Q series. So you have Q inverse term, and that's what makes it meromorphic at tau equals i infinity, um, plus 196884Q, plus all these numbers over here. So there is a very, it still has a well-defined Fourier expansion um, Q series. Right. Um, so these were modular functions. We also will need something known as mock modular forms. Uh, mock modular forms are functions that transform almost as a modular form, but not exactly. So in the sense that they could be holomorphic, but they don't satisfy the exact modularity properties. And this is something which is quite new in some sense. It was first discovered by Ramanujan as in the context of mock theta functions, which are almost theta type functions, but not quite theta functions but were really you know, um, studied in great detail uh, only in the 2000s by Thandas Vegas. Um, and uh, uh, his PhD is, is basically the go-to test for understanding what a modular form, mock modular form actually is. So since they don't transform quite as a modular form, you can make them to transform as a modular form by adding an extra function to it, which is known as a shadow. And uh, this was studied quite extensively also in this piece of work by Daboko, Murthy, and Zagier for n equals four string theory, which I would highly recommend. And in fact, the shadow is also related to the study of umbra moonshine, but I won't actually talk about this today. So an example of a mock modular form is, um, um, you can talk about this in terms of F2 of tau, and it's just this particular function defined over here, which is this R greater than S greater than zero. R minus S is an odd number times sum over one minus one to the R, S, Q, R, S over two. And it has a particular Q series given by this expression over here. Um, this F of two can be used to construct something known as H of tau, which is the weight half mod modular form. And that is just given by taking the F of two times 24 minus the Eisenstein two series. The Eisenstein two series is something which is a quasi modular form, but it's not a modular form in the sense that you, it's not a modular form, but you can make it modular by adding a completion to it. But at the same time, it's useful in the sense where you define maps between space and modular forms. So if you want to send a modular form of weight K to modular form weight K plus two, you would actually use the Eisenstein two series for that. Now the h of tau basically is a weight half function and it's kind of easy to see because you have weight two forms, the numerator and a weight three half form, the denominator, which gives you weight half form at the end of it. And this h of tau has um, a Fourier expansion series given in terms of this expression over here. So 1, 45, 231, 770, et cetera. So to someone who actually knows a bit of Matthew Bruce, this would already become clear where I'm going with this, but I will come back to this at a much later point in time. Right. And the final ingredient that we actually need is something known as Jacobi form. Now a Jacobi form is defined on SL2Z and it has a weight K and an index M. And uh, it is a function that is from H times C to C, which is both elliptic and modular in the sense that it has a modular property where tau goes to A tau plus B over C tau plus D and Z goes to Z over C tau plus D. And it transforms in this particular fashion over here for A, B, C, D and SL2Z. At the exact same time, it has an elliptic transformation where tau comma z goes to tau comma z plus lambda tau plus mu, where lambda and mu are integers and it transforms like this particular manner over here. And in both these elliptic and modular transformation properties, what you see is that um, the Jacobi form is still periodic in tau and z variables. That means you can still do a Fourier expansion of um, these Jacobi forms. And uh, one thing that we should notice is that these Jacobi forms have even weight and positive index for the purpose of this talk. 
And analogously, you can define Jacobi forms of congruent subgroups by just taking this to be a congruent subgroup of SO2Z rather than just SO2Z. So some examples of, SO, of Jacobi forms that we will encounter in this talk are the phi 0, 1 Jacobi form, which is basically the sum of um, theta i, the Jacobi theta functions of this particular form over here. And this phi 0, 1 is related to the elliptic genus of the K3 surface, which is basically two times phi 0, 1. Now what the elliptic genus is, I'll tell you about it a bit later, but essentially it's the count of BPS states in the K3 sigma model. And then you also have phi minus two comma one, which basically is eta one square over eta tau to the six. And this also has an interpretation in terms of a physical partition function in the sense that is the index of one eight BPS states in n equal to eight string theory. And this is studied in a paper by Malsina Moore and Strominger back in the 1990s. Um, the Jacobi forms are also, um, in the sense they can also be generated um, freely and there's a ring of weak Jacobi forms given in terms of phi 0, 1, phi minus 2, 1, e4, and e6. And this is due to the theorem of Eichstrom, Zagier, Feingold, and Frankel. And the statement is that you can take, construct any Jacobi form, weak Jacobi form, as taking a linear combination of phi 0, 1, phi minus 2, 1, e4, and e6 over here. So this will be a reason, this will be useful in constructing elliptic genera of arbitrary Calabria manifolds for which you know what the generic from the elliptic genus is, but you don't know exactly what it actually is. So that, that's the um, basic uh, part of number theory that you require to understand moonshine. But now let's move on to the second half of it, which is group theory. Um, so groups, as we all know, have an important um, role in physics because they help us quantify symmetry principles of the underlying theory. And when we all study group theory from physics points of view, for example, the standard model, grand unified theory, superconductivity, etc., we usually talk about infinite dimensional league groups. Now to a mathematician, an infinite dimensional league group is, is not as an interesting a problem as finite groups. And in fact, in, some, in the sense of classification, because the classification was already done back in the 1800s by Killing and Catan, um, but the finite groups, however, these are groups with finite order. These have a highly non-trivial classification. And in fact, it's so complicated that it literally took hundreds of mathematicians or 10,000 pages of proof over the span of five, six decades to come up with the classification. And in the 1970s, there was this classification published known as the Atlas of Finite Groups. And to a mathematician, this might seem a bit more interesting, whereas to a physicist, definitely uh, infinite dimensional league groups are much more interesting because they describe symmetries of physical systems more. But what we're gonna focus on today are a class of finite groups. And the class of finite groups are called sporadic groups. Um, and I will tell you what about what sporadic group actually is. So a finite group is, a group is finite if it's, got a fi if it's got an order that is not infinity. And a finite simple group is a group that has no normal subgroup. And the normal subgroup basically is a subgroup of all, is a set of all elements in G such, is, such that it is invariant under um, conjugation by all elements in G. So such subgroups do not exist in a simple group. Now there's a very famous theorem in um, group theory known as the John Holder theorem. And uh, the John Holder theorem basically tells you that you can decompose a finite group by quotienting with the normal group, normal subgroup, eventually, and you get a series um, which eventually terminates in the identity. And regardless of how you do this decomposition, you will always have the same length of the series. Now, another implication of this is that you can construct all finite groups from finite simple groups. So in the sense that finite simple groups are atomic in the study of finite group theory. And to classify finite simple groups, this is what the atlas of finite groups actually does. And the idea is that any finite simple group belongs to one of the four following families. You have three infinite families, the first of which are the cyclic groups, ZP, where P is prime. Oops. And you have the alternating groups, AN, for N greater than or equal to four. And you have the 16 Lie type families for finite simple groups, all of which are infinite family. But then you have a class of groups which don't belong to any of these groups, and these are on the sporadic groups. Now sporadic groups, 
uh, 26 in number, there are 26 of these guys, of which 20 of them are called the happy family in the sense that you have the largest for the group known as a monster group, and you can quotient them out in order to get 20 of the 26 pariah groups. And the remaining, which you do not get out by quotients, are known as the pariah groups. So the monster is actually a very interesting uh, mathematical object. In some sense, there is a very nice interview with John Conway, which one can look up on YouTube, uh, where John Conway says that you know uh, one of the biggest mysteries is why the monster actually exists. So the monster group was actually constructed in around the 1980s, and um, it has an order which is of roughly 10 to 53. It may seem large, but it's not actually quite large in the sense of group theory. But the order is actually given in terms of this particular prime factorization over here. And this is closely related to something known as a Jack Daniels problem in, um, in sporadic group theory, because these primes, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, all the way up to 71 over here, these prime factors in the orders of the monster group are the same primes which lead to a genus zero Riemann surface when you quotient the hyperbolic two surface with gamma naught p plus. So this gamma naught p plus is what I meant by the congruent subgroup having to be extended to include the equivalence of S transformations where tau goes to minus one over tau is not present in these groups. So you can extend that group to give you gamma p plus, gamma naught plus. And uh, so the idea is that you could take a hyperbolic two surface and then if you quotient it with this particular group over here, with gamma naught p, it's only for these values of p that you get a genus zero surface. And that's kind of an interesting problem. And it was proposed by Andrew Ogg to explain to uh, and Andrew Ogg asked why this problem actually is true. And the person who proves this particular um, relation or explains it quite um, comfortably actually receives a bottle of Jack Daniels from Andrew Ogg. But let's go into something slightly um, more towards moonshine. What we're interested in right now is the irreducible representations of the sporadic simple groups. And the irreducible representations basically, uh, first let's talk about the moonshine of, of the monster group. Um, due to the theorem of Mashka, we know that um, you can basically write all finite dimensional representations of a finite group in terms of irreducible representations which I would call irreps from now on. So the dimensions of the irreps of the monster group, these are 1, 1, 9, 6, 8, 8, 3, 2, 1, 2, 9, 6, 8, 7, 6, and all these very large numbers. And it was in the 1970s that an interesting observation was made. So if you recall that uh, the J of tau, um, uh, the normalized J of tau has a Q series of this particular form over here. Um, Mackay in the 1978 um, um, or something observed that this 196884 is precisely 196883 plus one, where one is the trivial dimension of the trivial irrepresentation, irreducible representation of the monster group, and 196883 is the dimension of the first non trivial irreducible representation of the monster group. And this is, of course, something which was very interesting, but then Mackay shared this with some colleagues of his. And it then turned out that it wasn't just the first coefficient of 196884 which had this particular phenomenon. Um, Thompson showed that the first few coefficients could actually be written in terms of sums of irreducible rep dimensions of irreducible representations of the monster group. And then subsequently Conway and Norton showed that this is true for all coefficients of um, the G of tau that they can be written in terms of linear combinations of dimensions of irreducible representation of the monster group. And this is something which is sort of weird because what does a number theory have to know about group theory? So why do coefficients of modular forms have to know anything about the dimensions of irreducible representation of swarthy groups? And in fact, this is where the term moonshine actually comes from. So moonshine actually is something which means absolutely insane. And the idea seemed so far-fetched and insane that it ended up being coined as moonshine at this point of time. So this phenomenon over here, where you do this for the monster group, that is known as monster moonshine. That is the Fourier coefficients of J of tau in the Q expansion 
are given in terms of linear combinations of dimensions of irreducible representations of monster group. So that is a statement or the primitive statement of monster moonshine. So how do you go about understanding what monster moonshine actually is? So one way to do about do this is that you have these particular numbers, one, one, nine, six, eight, eight, four, and all these numbers. And the trick is to start interpreting them in terms of graded representations. So you have something known as a V natural, which is a monster module. So you can think of it as a vector space and you can decompose the vector space into vector space with, let's say, with a minus one character, vector space with one character, with two, so on and so forth, until you get the so-called graded representation. And the dimension of each of these vector spaces is precisely the dimension of the irreducible representation of the monster group, sum of the dimensional values of the monster group. So you could basically try to write down the J function in terms of this particular expression, where you write it in terms of dimensions of irreducible of dimensions of some particular vector space, not in terms of representation of monster group. So that's the first layer of the problem. Now the second layer of the problem is to prove that such a vector space actually exists. So in order to prove what these vector spaces actually are, you need to define um, what are known as Mackay Thompson series. So you can take an element G that belongs to the monster group, and for each element G, you have a series. Um, known as the Mackay Thompson series, which is given by the trace over the vector space over n of, and you have a G insertion over there, times Q to the n, and with the condition that you with the, with the, when G is equal to the identity element, you recover the um, uh, J function. So these series are known as Mackay Thompson series, and these are the unique generators of modular functions for a genus zero subgroup gamma G of SL2R. So let's take a minute to appreciate what this actually means. So when I say something to be a unique generator of modular function uh, on a genus zero subgroup, I basically mean I, there's a word for it known as a hop module. And uh, I won't go into properties of what a hop module is, but what is also important for us is to understand what the genus zero actually means. So you know that SOZ has a fundamental domain and so do these genus, so do these Congo subgroups, they all have fundamental domains. Now the fundamental domains are in some sense um, isomorphic to a Riemann surface of some particular genus. And usually these gene, the genus of these surfaces tend to be zero and hence they're known as genus zero groups or genus zero subgroups. So that's a mathematically naive way of defining it. A more complicated way will have to involve Galois extensions and computing Euler characteristics but roughly you can think of it as the same definition here. So you have a gamma G subgroup um, of SL2R um, where G is basically um, defined in such a way that gamma naught of N is a normal subgroup of gamma G and N is basically zero mod order of G times the GCD of 24 comma order of G. So this is a slightly weird um, definition for what gamma G actually is, but I won't go into why this is true for gamma G. And due to conjugation, you can conjugate G with other elements of the monster group. And because of conjugation, you don't have to construct an infinite number of these Mackay Thompson series. You only have a finite number of them. And um, you have about 191 conjugacy classes of the monster group. And there are about 174 Mackay Thompson series that one can actually consider. So that is to say that the vector space associated to the vector space that I've been going on about over here has 194, um, so to say, uh, Mackay Thompson series that you can consider, 174, sorry. Um, so to first construct what this vector space actually is, uh, we need to understand what, um, um, sorry, let me see, okay. So understand where this vector space actually comes from, there's a hint from understanding it in terms of conformal field theory of 24 chiral bosons on a Leech lattice. So a Leech lattice is one of the 24 even unimodular self-dual lattices of rank 24. So you have in 24 dimensions, you have 24 such lattices. One of it is the Leech lattice and the remaining 23 are known as the Niemeyer lattices. So the Niemeyer lattices are also sort of related to moonshine phenomena in the sense of Mathieu moonshine and umbral moonshine and I'll talk about this a bit later. 
But the construction of V natural was shown to be exactly the CFT of 24 chiral bosons on the leach lattice. So the partition function of this particular conform field theory is basically given in terms of the J function plus 24, which is basically a lamp, the theta function of the leach lattice divided by eta tau to 24. So for those who don't know what a theta function is, the theta function of a particular lattice basically gives you, it has a Q series expansion. And the interpretation of the Q series is that the coefficients in the Q series tell you about the number of vectors of the um, of norm square equal to the power of Q in the Q, or two times the power of Q in the Q series. So it basically tells you how many vectors there are at a given length. So that's a theta function of a lattice. Um, so you have these 24 um, sitting in this particular um, function over here, but we are only interested in the J of tau. We don't want the 24 anymore. So these are so-called in some sense, weight one fields or massless fields, and you could remove them by an asymmetric Z2 orbifold. And this was actually the first instance of an asymmetric orbifold in string theory, was studied by Dixon, Ginsburg, and Harvey. Um, so when you remove the weight one, represent states from Z2 orbifold, the next states, uh, max states, span a 196, 883 dimensional space. And uh, associated with this space is a non-associative commutative algebra known as the Gris algebra. Now this Gris algebra has precisely the automorphism group, which is the group. And this is something which is quite interesting because you already make connections to show where the monster group actually arises from. Um, I have about 10 to 12 minutes, right? I think. Yes, but you can use the extra two or three okay. minutes. Okay. okay. So, okay. so to complete the proof of um, the um, uh, of the monster Munche conjecture, um, it is first important to show that this TG are precisely the half module of the gamma of G. So without this particular key statement, the whole proof doesn't go through. And this was shown by Burchard's. And the way he did it was to show that there exists a so-called generalized Katsumuri algebra for the monster group. It's a monster Lie algebra N. And using an isomorphism that relies on quantization of bosonic string theory, Burchard was able to show that the generalized Katsumuri algebra um, basically was able to show that the TG that you get from the um, Maketam series are precisely the hop module for the gamma G over here. And this particular isomorphism is something known as the gora thorn theorem or the no ghost theorem in bosonic string theory. And it basically shows an isomorphism of functors that use in different sort of quantizations of bosonic string theory. Uh, I won't go into what functors are because I'm not going much into category theory, but I believe um, Pavel already spoke about functors and they will also be spoken about in later talks. So this sort of, you can actually study this in Polchinski's textbook on bosonic string theory, if you're interested. And the, com the completion of this proof where Burton was able to show this and thereby complete the proof of the monster moonshine um, conjecture, um, he was given the Fields Medal in 1998. So it is a bit of an intense bit of mathematics uh, for me to explain over here, which I will not do. Um, there's also something known as a generalized monster of moonshine conjecture. So, so far you only took a G, whereas you took the um, a G insertion in the um, the, the, the G trace in the vector space um, uh, to construct this Makaitam series, but you can also add another element GH, where G and H are commuting pair of elements in M. And these are known as um, generalized um, uh, Makaitam series, or rather they're known as twisted twine series. So this TG, you can think of this as just a twisted series, or just twisted torus. And TGH, you can think of a series where you twist and twine the torus, basically. So to show that the monster moonshine actually goes through, it's also important to show that there's a generalized moonshine. And to show the generalized moonshine, you need to show that the TG of H satisfies the following properties, in that you can take TG of A, HC, GB, HD, where A, B, C, they are elements of SL2Z. And then you get, recover the original TGH up to some factor which is 24th root of unity. And they're also invariant in the conjugation. And um, we also studied, we sort of stated that this TG over the V natural is basically a hop module for SL2Z. TG of H has two possibilities. One is either a constant or it's a hop module for SL2Z. That is by inserting of a twining, it either stays a hop module 
or basically becomes a constant. And it's also, um, um, the, then the final condition of course is that if you insert G equals to identity, that is you don't twist the torus anymore, you just recover the simple Makaitam series for H. So the proof of generalized moonshine was for the problem of generalized moonshine was first um, stated in a paper by Simon Norton, and then proven by Scott Carnahan in a set of three papers um, uh, many years later. So where does all of this fit into string theory? Well, for those of you who may have been keeping tabs literature, there were these set of papers by Witten and Witten Maloney, where it was argued that um, the monster um, the conformal field theory could be dual to um, three-dimensional, pure three-dimensional gravity, but then there were certain issues with this particular setup. But if you take 3D chiral gravity, that is if you take, for example, topological mass of gravity as studied by Lee Song and Stromger, there you could actually make a statement that there is a connection between 3D chiral gravity and the 2D CFT dual to it is the CFT corresponding to the monster module V natural over here. And uh, this has kind of been um, studied in a very nice paper by Duncan and Frankel, which I would highly recommend if you're interested in TD gravity and in moonshine. And there's also the relation between uh, extending this to supergravity statement or super, supersymmetric statement where you consider this TG and TGH not to be just twisted twine um, functions, but rather actually twisted twine partition functions. And the partition functions correspond to BPS states in heterotic quantum mechanics. And this was studied by in a paper by uh, Natalie Paquette, Daniel Pesson, and Roberto Valpato. So there's just some references for those of you who are interested. Um, in the last 10 minutes or so, which I'm not doing any justice, I would like to introduce uh, Matthew Moonshine. Um, so Matthew Moonshine is sort of more recent Moonshine, which was in, discovered only in the 2010s by in a paper by Eguchi, Hiroshi Uguri, and Yuji Tachikawa. And the central element here, or the central figure here is the K3 surface, which is a two complex dimensional hyperkähler manifold and is the only non-trivial example of a Calabria twofold. Um, so the elliptic genus of K3 basically is a function that counts the BPS states in a K3 sigma model. And the sigma model is precisely an N equals 4 comma 4 superconformal field theory with C equals C bar equals six. Now the elliptic genus of K3 is defined as the trace of the Ramon Ramon sector of this particular um, expression over here. So this particular form is, should be clear to everyone who's done doing confirmed field theory or written indices or something, um, where L and L naught bar are basically the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic so generators. And J naught is the third component of the SU2 R symmetry. And the SU2 R symmetry basically means that you have there's an SU2 symmetry between the ways in which you can rotate the supercharges of the N equals four comma four algebra between each other. And due to the nature of spectral flow, you can also define this elliptic genus over the trace of the NSNS sector. And F here, of course, is the fermion number. Now the elliptic genus of K3 is a Jacobi form. And the Jacobi form is precisely two times phi zero comma one that we introduced in the number theory section of this talk. Um, and since the elliptic genus counts um, the number of BPS states in theory in one fell swoop, you can ask basically the question is, if whether you can recover not just the full BPS partition function, but also understand how the BPS states are organized into the Hilbert space of the theory. That is, can you decompose not just in, into BPS states or not just the number of BPS states, but can you also decompose the elliptic genus to get information about the BPS subspaces of the n equals four comma four Hilbert space? And the way you do that is to do something like the character expansion in terms of n equals four characters superconformal characters. So you could write down the elliptic genus not as a Fourier expansion now, but rather as something slightly more involved where you have the characters of the n equals four comma four expansion over here divided by, given by CH n equals four. And you have two different kinds of characters. You have the massive and the massless characters. And the limit where you have a unitary conformal field theory that is C equals, um, uh, that is when you get the BPS limit of this theory. Um, Sorry, this is supposed to be a Z over here. Um, typo, please ignore that. Uh, when you do this particular character expansion over here, um, you get this particular form where A N has this particular number. So you have A zero equals minus one minus one bar. 
A1 equals 45 plus 45 bar, A2 equals 231 plus 231 bar, so on and so forth. And these 1, 45, 231, 770, et cetera, are precisely the dimensions of the irreducible representations of the M24 Mathieu group, which is also another sporadic group. So that's an interesting question because then you can ask, make a statement on Mathieu Munshein, which is that you have a K3 elliptic genus and your character expansion in terms of n equals four characters, and you recover dimensions of irreps of the M24 group. But at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that um, the Mathieu Munshein is a weight half Munshein, but here phi zero comma one is a weight zero Jacobi form. So what do am I talking about? Um, but the way you actually talk about weight half Munshein is that you recover elliptic genus of K3 in terms of this particular combination over here where H of tau is the Mach modular form that I introduced earlier in this talk. And that is a weight half Mach modular form, which has this particular Q series over here. And again, you see that 1, 45, 231, et cetera, are precisely the dimension that reduce the representations of the Mathieu 24 group. So you could still do a particular sort. You can give these things interpretations as dimensions of vector spaces, and then try to do the same principle all over again. And the proof of the Mathieu Moonshine was actually given, uh, studied by Terry Gannon in a very nice paper called Much Ado About Mathieu. And in fact, interestingly, Gannon also gave a set of 25 lectures in Istanbul called the Istanbul Lectures on Moonshine. Uh, they're fantastic lectures. So if anyone is interested, I definitely urge you to go ahead and read these lectures. So that's the part where you study Mathieu Moonshine, but there's also a generalized Mathieu Moonshine, which was studied by Gabriel Volpato and Honega, and of course, many others. And I won't go into the details over here, but the idea is that you can generalize Moonshine not just to twisted um, um, elliptic genera of K3, but also twisted twine elliptic genera of K3. And the same sort of principle goes through, where G and H in the twisted twine are commuting elements of N24. So if Matthew 24 is sort of well understood, what is so important or what's so interesting over here? And the problem comes from understanding what the N24 group actually acts on. So unlike the monster group where you have a GKM algebra, which has monster automorphism, there is no obvious object on which the M24 acts. And the relation between K3 and M24 is something that's not new exactly. It's something that's been known since the 1970s or the 1980s due to Thier, Mukha, and Kondo, which tells you that the group of all the automorphisms preserving the K3 synthetic form is a subgroup of M23, which is a subgroup of M24. But you can ask about a quantum version of the mukha kondo theorem where you ask the automorphisms which preserve supersymmetry. And it turns out that the group of supersymmetry preserving automorphisms of the K3 sigma model is a subset of Conway 1, a different sporadic group, but never really M24. So that leaves a question as to what the object actually is. So one idea that was to come about by Tamin and Wedland was that since the elliptic genus counts only the BPS states, the M24 must be a symmetry of only the BPS states. So the conjecture no, the symmetry of the conjecture is that if you combine the set of symmetries of all the K3 sigma models, nonlinear sigma models, you will recover M24. But in this fantastic paper by Gabriel, Tamino, Walpata, and Wenland, it was shown that the combined set of symmetries is a maximal subgroup of M24, which is Z2 to the 8, M20, but um, not exactly M24. There's just one generator shot. So it's kind of frustrating, of course, that you're so close, but it's not. Um, you're just one generation shot of recovering the whole M24 group. Abiram, can you wrap up in two minutes, please? Yeah, I can. I'm okay, done. thanks. Yeah. So well, one question that we could ask, of course, is that perhaps M24 is not a feature of the K3 surface, but if it's a feature of phi 0 comma 1. And this was a paper that we studied in 2017, where we did the analysis of halitic genera for high dimension Calabi-Aus and uh, using the Jacobi form ring property over there. And we found that there were no Mackay-Thompson functions. So implication being that maybe K3 is special after all. But there's also a different connection that you can ask in string theory, which is that if BPS states are impacted in Mathieu Munshine, can you recover Mathieu Munshine from more complicated BPS invariants like gromo witten invariants? And there are some status study papers that are written uh, analyzing this and the answer is actually, yes, you can do it. So let me just give you some kind of putting remarks. So firstly, um, I spoke only about Mathieu and the monster group over here, but you also have moon trines for other sporadic groups and even pariahs. And there are quite a lot of these examples, for example, the Conway group, the Thompson group, Onan, Harada, Norton, Baby Monster, they all have different moon trines. And uh, 
to ask about this unifying theme for moonshines, this was addressed in a very nice paper recently by Brandon Dreyhorn, Harvey et al. Um, there's also an interesting correction between connection between error correction and material moon, and moonshines. And this partly has to do with the fact that you have sphere packing and lattices with the leech lattice, et cetera. And this was more um, fleshed out in this very nice paper by Moore and Harvey earlier this year. And you also have certain connections between black holes and moonshine due to this umbral thing, which I will not talk about over here at all. If you're just interested, please go have a look at it. Um, but there are a lot of open questions just from what I spoke about today, which is that are K3 and Matthew, what's the relation between K3 and Matthew moonshine? whether all sporadic groups have moonshines and whether they could all be explained in a similar mathematical manner. And uh, the main reason why string theorists got interested in moonshine was because there was a hope that these sporadic groups could be symmetries of certain objects from string theory or from algebra that's hidden in string theory. Um, and this, of course, is a question that we just cannot answer right now because we don't know enough at this point. But these are questions one could think about at some point. So. Moonshine is just more than a crazy idea. In fact, it's a sort of deep connection between different branches of mathematics, such as lattices, number theory, and sporadic groups for the mathematician. But the physicist, these are connections between string compactifications, partition functions, and conformal field theories, which have elements of number theory, sporadic group theory, and lattices inside of them. So for the example of the monster moonshine, you could take the Leech lattice, the J function, the monster group, and then you can construct the vertex upgrade algebra of 24 bosons of removing weight one states. And similarly, for the Mathieu group, you could take one of the Niemeyer lattices, um, do a heterotic type two compactification to recover K3 signal model described by K3, and then has a symmetry of M24. Of course, there are some open questions within the Mathieu moonshine as well. But the question, of course, is whether such sort of a similar structure and tetrahedra actually follow for other moonshine and other sporadic groups as well. So with this, I will stop. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Abiram. So we can take a few questions. Uh, if you have questions to Abiram. If there are no questions, let me ask a few simple ones. So Abiram. Excuse yeah. me, are, are there any questions? Okay, so let me ask my questions. So you said, for instance, uh, SL2ZX nicely on modular forms, right? Mm. I mean, modular forms behave nicely on the actions of SL2Z. Yeah. And also SL2ZX nicely on the torus, right? With, yeah. Which is spent by a certain lattice, one and tau. Mm. So can you think of these modular forms, uh, certain functions that live on these tori? Yeah, certainly. There actually is a alternate definition of modular forms it as a certain uh, mapping between tori and the complex plane and lattices in the complex planes as well. So there is a much more elaborate definition of um, these things, modular forms. Uh, I don't remember the exact definition of it. Uh, I'll put it up in the notes or you can actually even look at my thesis, which is on Inspire right now, but there is a definition. Okay where modular forms can be defined on lattices as well. Okay, so one more question. So these tori or K3 surfaces in the case of other certain modular forms uh, pop up in the string theory when we, for instance, compactify it to four dimensions and things like that. Sorry, Is can you say true? that again? So we had certain modular forms, right? And they had, or mock modular forms or other adjective modular forms, mm. which I don't know very well. So these modular forms, Pop up uh, because we have, for instance, we do compactifications of string theories, right? On certain toruses, for instance, or some other spaces, maybe, or sure. Calabias. Yeah. So they pop up because there's a connection like this. Can you say that? Well, no, they pop or up is because it too it's a function. No. Well, in string theory, you do you have the world sheet theory and the space time theory. Yes. Space time theory is what I was talking about. That is the four dimensional compactification part of it. But there's also dual description in terms of the world sheet theory, which is a two-dimensional theory. Okay. And these modular forms pop up as partition functions on the world sheet theory. Oh, I see. I see. So okay. Yeah. So what I said is not so, so correct. All right. I mean, they, they do. I mean, that's not entirely wrong what you said because you do have modular forms which appear in um, the world in the space time theory as well. Because when you do Calabi-Yau compactification or T six or whatever, you do get out. Um, 
um, modular forms in the sense that when you do a Calabria, for example, mm -hmm. if the Calabria is elliptically fibered, then you will get out a modular form from the T2 fibration of it. But it depends on what you're actually trying to do. If you're trying to count something or write down you know, an elliptic form or something like this, elliptic curve or something like that, then you will see something that looks like a modular form or Jane variant or something. But the modular forms that I spoke about here, these are related mm -hmm. to partition functions of a world sheet theory. Okay, all right. And one last quick question as well. So these modular forms, for instance, just the modular forms, they, they make up a vector space, right? If I'm correct. They're ring, but they're also vector space or not? Well, um, in terms of these special functions, E4, E6, Eisenstein series, yeah, and so on well, and so forth. Can you? Yes. 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 For every weight k, you have a finite, yes. finite dimensional vector space. It is, a, it is a vector space with a finite. For dimension. every k, you every, see, right? For a level. Okay. okay. Yes. Thanks. Yes, that's right. Even weight k. But you, you can do it for not just modular forms, but also like classification of modular forms. You can do it for. Um, okay, no, let me not say this. I'll just confuse things. But uh, yes, that's right. They do form a vector space. Okay. Are there any other questions? I have one I question. Up. Okay. Can uh, you say your name, please? Uh, I'm Keram Jan, and I'm one of the organizers too. Uh, uh, as you relate seemingly random numbers to each other, I wanted to ask that uh, you said there are exactly 26 sporadic groups. Mm -hmm. And is there a deeper meaning behind the number 26? or like 16 for the lead type groups. Is it something meaningful, this number two? Um, I it's just a coincidence. Know. I don't know if there's a significance to number 26 over here. Um, I don't know about the lead type groups. I haven't studied the lead groups, the final type, final lead type groups, I haven't studied that in detail. But the 26 over here, it's not um, really that much of uh, importance because Depending on who you ask, it'll be either 26 or 25, because certain mathematicians will say it's um, you have the three infant families, uh, the three infant families, plus there's one weird group called the tits group, and then they have the 25 sporadic groups, or then you, you could put the tits group in the sporadic groups as well. So it's not really um, uh, these things, but it's a much deeper question to ask why the sporadic groups even exist. So that's a very deep question. And that, yeah, I don't know the answer to this question either. Thank you. So thanks again, Abhi. If you kindly unmute yourself and would like to thank Abhiram, uh, we can clap you now, Abhi. Thanks for the nice talk. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for organizing this.